we have all had times where we have experienced the emotions around sin. After we've committed the sin, we carry shame and guilt and this feeling of separation from God and perhaps fear. And there's some consequence to our sin. And so while we didn't necessarily experience the same kind of sin that David did, like with adultery and murder, we have experienced what it feels like to be in this place where we know we messed up. And so we're going to look at David's example in that today and how he really comes to this place of not just asking for forgiveness, but repentance and how that's the key to our restored relationship with God. I pray today's episode blesses you. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what he says in his word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach. And I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with him, and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand his will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, before we get into today's episode, I have a quick word. I know that you have been frustrated with being confident in how to tell the difference between hearing from God and wondering if it's your own voice. I know, I've been there myself. That's why I wrote the Bible study, She Hears, Learning to Listen to Jesus. This is a six-week study that takes you through the book of John, looking at six women in the life of Jesus, how he calls them, how he encourages them, how he equips them. It also teaches the color method of Bible study, helping you to learn how to really understand the scriptures. I also include a lot of cultural and historical information that makes these familiar passages of scripture really come alive. This is a great study to do with maybe your teen girls or a group of friends from church, and it will really help you gain confidence in how to hear from the Lord and set you up with some tools that will stay with you long after the study is over. Again, head to shehears.org and you can find the Bible study on the resources page. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. Today we are in Psalm 51, and Psalm 51 is a psalm of David, which we haven't had psalms of David for a couple weeks now, but this is a psalm that he wrote, and it's when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had committed, after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And so as you can imagine, the, the place he was in spiritually was not good. He he was in a place of really recognizing his sin and, and coming before God. So I'm going to start with verse one. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. That I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. 
So Psalm 51 is one that's considered a personal lament. We started off the Psalms, the beginning of the Psalms in book one was a lot of lament Psalms. So if you remember, lament is sometimes it's grief. Sometimes it's sorrow over sin. This, in this particular instance, this is David grieving and sorrowing over the sin that he's committed before God. And while there are other Psalms that do that, this one is kind of unique. In in fact, it's been called one of the pearls of the Psalter. The Psalter meaning that's how scholars refer to the Psalms. It, it is as it stands alone. The book of Psalms is called the Psalter. But anyway, it's called one of the pearls of the Psalter because there are seven Psalms that are repentant like this, but this one demonstrates kind of this essence of true repentance, where it's not just a confession of sin, but it's really getting to this place we'll, we'll look at where David is saying, okay, God, turn over every area of my heart and, and, and create in me this clean heart because I just long to be right with you. And we can just hear David's repentance in this process. This Psalm of David, it's it's a confession in a lot of ways. And he wrote it after Nathan, who was the prophet, confronted him about the sin of adultery and murder. So if you are not familiar with that story, you can go back to 2 Samuel 12, uh, and it's like 1 through 13. And I, I've said this before, and this is part of the reasons I say this, is when we are reading about different individuals in scripture. One of the things that I love about scripture is that God uses regular people. And even though they are people that are capable of sin and do sin, God is a God that redeems all things. And he's a God that forgives. And he's a God that can can use messy people despite our humanness. And, and it proves the need for us to have Jesus to offer salvation on our behalf because we are all desperate without him. We're all sinners. And so, but my point is that there are some parts of scripture that are prescriptive and there are some parts that are descriptive and you have to kind of examine what's going on before you start emulating that person. And so if we are talking about God or Jesus or something that God is doing or the way somebody is serving in ministry, that's one thing. But when you look to somebody like David, we have to recognize he wasn't perfect. We have to recognize that he committed some atrocious sins in his life. And so it's not always prescriptive for us to act like David. Of course, you know, we can't justify something like adultery or murder because David did that. But yet that's the same kind of attitude we take when it comes to maybe like testing God, like did Gideon did, or some people will even say things like, you know, having more than one spouse because of the patriarchs or, or whatever. Instead, what we have to understand that this is descriptive. It's describing the things that happen in David's life. It's not prescriptive, meaning it's not something that we should be doing ourselves. I just want to put that reminder out there. So this psalm was written by someone who knew God. Think about this. He knew God, but he had deliberately defied God in a serious, serious way. And the result of that was that he felt cut off from God's presence. See, that's what sin does. And yesterday we talked a little bit about hypocrisy and the dangers of getting into the routine of faith and the routine of Christianity and leaving the, the relationship aspect out of it. Because what I said yesterday was, is this path towards hypocrisy is sometimes a slippery slope. Here we have David, somebody who loved the Lord. We've seen that evidenced over and over throughout the Psalms. He loved the Lord, yet even David who has been described as a man after God's own heart. Even David messed up, messed up really bad. I mean, adultery and murder are some of the biggest sins you, you can commit. And so the result of that is David felt separated from God. That's what sin does to us. It separates us from God's presence. And so David probably wrote this Psalm after he had repented and Nathan had confirmed God's forgiveness to him. Yet David is still pleading. That's what we see here. We see him pleading for his relationship with God to be restored. Um, I think that's important because David knows what a relationship with God can be like. So not as this, this isn't just somebody that, you know, 
messed up and now they feel guilty and there's this shame and they're coming to God to seek forgiveness because they feel the weight of that. This instead is somebody that had a close relationship with God, that that spoke to God, that got, heard God's voice, that acted on God's behalf. And then he committed these huge sins and that distance that that sin created in his relationship with God, that's the sorrow. That's the part that he's, yes, he's feeling guilty over the sin, but the the sorrow that we're hearing here is over the separation from God. And, and I don't know about you, but sometimes that's enough to make me not sin. I mean, just that, that and I think that's the hope, like because I have experienced close relationship with God, I pers- I want to pursue a life of righteousness because I don't want to lose that relationship with God. Because once you've experienced it, once you've tasted it, once you've learned what that is, I don't know how people function in their life without it. And and so, you know, not that I want to commit adultery or murder, of course not. Um, but even things like, you know, maybe you don't know. <laughs> Sometimes even just things like, I will get mad about um, something that somebody says to one of my kids or a friend of mine, and I just want to punch them in the face. And I'm like, I can't punch somebody in the face because, you know, sin. And it wouldn't look good for a Bible teacher to punch somebody in the face. But I'm not going to say I haven't thought about it. But I also crave that relationship with God. And I don't want to put myself in this place where there's a separation between me and God's presence. Although God is such a forgiving God and he, he, he knows that this is a, an area I struggle with. And not that I, I don't, please don't write me. It's not that I randomly punch people. But when you're a, a mom, um, there's a mama bear that can come out that is very protective. That's, you know, I'm a justice warrior and that that's parts of that are redeemed and parts of it I, I'm, I'm still struggling with. But anyway, um, so, so what what we're seeing this theme in Psalm 51 is this theme of David asking for mercy. And I think anyone that has ever sinned or felt overwhelmed by feelings of guilt, we're all able to find forgiveness in God. And that's that's the beauty of our relationship with God. And there's this essence of spiritual cleansing and this renewed relationship with God that we can have, but he's not going to impose that on us. That's, that's the key. We have to ask him for that. And I don't know if you have experienced this, but sometimes when I have done something or I'm in a place of feeling guilty, or I know that I've sinned, I am in the past, not so much now, but I have been hesitant to go to God because it was like, man, I don't, I don't want him to know, or I don't want to face this in front of him. And the reality is, is he already knows. He obviously knows he sees everything. He knows everything. And so the way that we deal with that sin is coming to God and saying, okay, I royally messed up. I need your help to get out of this mess. And so what this Psalm shows us is that there is mercy that we can find in our relationship with God. And so David starts to request forgiveness and the spiritual renewal that happens is based on God's grace. And remember, grace is defined is as um, like favor that's undeserved. It's, it's not anything that we deserve. It's only found as this free gift in a relationship with God. And he finds, of course, mercy and this unfailing love that God offers us. For believers, the death of Jesus for our sins is what provides forgiveness when we humble ourselves and we come to him and we ask for forgiveness. We have to confess our sin and we have to then it's not enough to just confess our sin, but then we have to trust God and depend on him and ask him to help change the simple behavior because that's where repentance is. If I ask for forgiveness and then I just keep doing the same thing over and over and over, um, there, I, I firmly believe that sometimes there's a difference between one sin and a habit of sin. And I mean, don't get me wrong. They both separate us from God, but sometimes we mess up. We're humans. It's just, it's, you know, part of this human experience. But sometimes there are habitual sins that we do over and over and over and over again. And it's not enough to just ask God to forgive us, but it's, it's that next step. Repentance means turning away from your sin. So in essence, it's saying, okay, God, I'm going to surrender this thing to you. Help me, help me with this mess I've made in my life. Help me to turn away from this and and the, the beauty about our relationship with God is that he has the power to do that. He's longing to do that in our lives. David says, 
In verse 3, let me read it. It says, For I know my transgressions and my sin are always before me. At times, it might be difficult to believe or even accept that we've been forgiven, especially when we have committed something atrocious. You know, he is facing adultery and murder. It is what he's asking God for forgiveness for. And before we get to this place of restored relationship with God, it can be hard to accept the fact that he offers us forgiveness because forgiveness, the way that God forgives us is different than the way we forgive ourselves or the way that we forgive other people. We may say that we forgive with our words, but we don't necessarily always forgive with our emotions. That's not the way that God offers forgiveness. And so if you are someone that has known this joy that comes from salvation and this relationship with God, and then you've fallen to this place of spiritual failure, it's kind of natural to experience a grief and a a struggle, like a spiritual struggle, especially before your relationship with God has been restored. And, And that kind of takes a little bit of time. It's a process for us. Um, and it's not on, on God's end. It's a process because when God forgives, he forgives completely. But when, for us to feel forgiven, I think sometimes that's a process. And so that's what we're seeing here with David's struggle in this Psalm, the emotional experience. It's kind of revealing how fearful he is and how emotionally devastated he is and how serious this is. And especially after knowing God and being in close relationship with him, it takes time for that relationship to feel restored on our end. Verse four says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. So David's not saying that he had not wronged anyone else by his serious offenses. Obviously he did. Adultery and murder are offenses to other people. It's not just a sin against himself. But he's essentially saying that the greatest sin that he had committed was against God and his word. And as serious as the sins of adultery and murder are, this David is feeling and recognizing that the sin against God was worse. That That's the place that he's in. That's the emotional place that he's in at this point. And then in verse five, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. We see David acknowledging that he was born, that we're all born with this natural pull towards rebellion against God. I mean, it's not like you have to teach kids how to be bad. Like, you know, it's just, they do it on their own. You know, they're, um, when we're little, when we're babies, you don't have to teach us to, sin. I mean, it's just kind of the natural, it's, and that's what scripture says. It's the natural bend or the natural pull of our hearts before we meet Christ and before we have this authentic relationship with him. And, you know, we see that I, I've, I was, a, I've been a children's pastor in my previous life. I was a children's pastor for a decade. And so I, I have yet to meet a kid that you have to teach them how to be bad. Um, if anything, it's the opposite, of course. And so that's, but that's not even the excuse that David is is saying at this point. He is taking full responsibility for his own mistakes and failures. And and realistically, ever since we see sin enter the world um, back in Genesis 3, we recognize that every single person is born with this selfish desire to do your own thing and to go your own way and to be your own person and to satisfy your own pleasure. And sometimes even if it causes pain or suffering for other people, because the pull is, is to be selfish and to deal with our own desires before somebody else's desire. And so this, this posture of sinfulness, there's only one way to overcome that. And the only way to overcome that is by accepting God's forgiveness, which is provided to us by Jesus's death on the cross. And we have to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to get through it, to, to not succumb to the, the sinful pressures of our heart. When we work through the Holy Spirit, he enables us to live a life of righteousness. And it's not that we're never going to mess up. It's not that we're never going to 
you know, have to come to this place of confession and surrender. But the whole point of having the the gift of the Holy Spirit is that the scriptures say that he's our helper. He's our advocate. He empowers us to stand up against sin. We are powerless to do that on our own. It's only through the regeneration of our spirits and our hearts and our minds and our souls through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can resist those temptations. Verse 10 is a verse that is quoted a lot. And I, and I wonder sometimes if people recognize the context in which it's written. It says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That place that David's at is, it's kind of the pinnacle of the Psalm where he's saying, okay, God, I know my heart's not pure. I'm asking you to create a pure heart in me and to re- renew this steadfast spirit within me. He's saying this in the context of immense sin. He's saying this after he's messed up royally. And the encouragement I think that we can see there is that God is always waiting for us to come to him, to renew our hearts, to restore relationship. And so as followers of God, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we need the gift of the Holy Spirit to purify our hearts. And and that's the change that brings us this openness towards God. And it helps us to hate the things that God hates, which is sin. And, and it helps us resist sin. And it gives us this um, desire to pursue kingdom living and God's standard for our lives and God's purpose for our lives. That's the fire that fuels those things. And so there will be at times um, a need to continually renew our spirits because we're human, because we live in a fallen sinful world, because we are faced with temptations that are sometimes too hard for us to resist. Like that's part of the human experience, but that's why we need Jesus. And I think sometimes as believers, we get to a place where we feel so guilty for messing up that we don't even want to take that thing to God. But we spent a whole week on confession. If you haven't listened to it, you can go back to uh, earlier this year. We spent a whole week talking about confession and how the whole point of confession is to restore a relationship with God. But we can't get there if we don't confess to him what's going on or confess to the other person that we sinned against and work through those things. God wants to meet us in that place. And I say that all the time that God meets us where we are. He knows that we're messy. He knows that we're sinful. He knows that we've messed up. That's why we needed Jesus in the first place. And that's why he sent the Holy Spirit to be our advocate, our helper, because he knows we can't do it on our own. Only the God who created us in the first place can recreate us from the inside out and restore us to a right relationship with him. But, but that's the beauty of our relationship with God because he is our creator. He's the one that can create a new heart in us. I love that aspect. In verse 11, he says, do not cast from me, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. David is recognizing, he knows that if God removes his power and the presence and he exposes sin and he gets to a place where he doesn't have God's empowerment then the hope of renewing his relationship with God is gone. And of course, God's not going to do that. But he's, he's speaking from a place of fear. Remember, sin separates us from God. And so when we're separated from God, we do have more fear, we do have more anxiety, we do have um, the burden of the emotional aspect that comes along with being separated from God. Verse 12, it says, restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. I love that verse because the Lord restores David's joy. But notice there's a couple things I want you to notice about David's life. Number one, scripture teaches us that we will reap what we sow. And that's, we see that in the New Testament in Galatians 6, 7. And basically what that means is however we conduct our lives will have a direct impact on what happens to us. And, and sometimes you'll hear this called uh, seed faith when it comes to planting seeds. And, and uh, even from an evangelistic perspective, sometimes we 
we'll plant seeds and somebody else, another believer, you know, we'll plant seeds, meaning we'll share the gospel with somebody. And then another be- believer will come along and share a testimony. And maybe another believer comes along and, and is able to pray with somebody to come to faith in Christ. That's kind of this idea of seed faith. But in this kind of same wheelhouse is this idea of you reap what you sow. Sowing meaning not like sowing with a needle, but sowing like in the ground. You sow seeds. You're, it's it's basically saying you're planting seeds. Well, when you reap what you sow, that means whatever you plant is what's going to grow. Whatever you plant in your life is what's going to grow. If you are planting kindness and gentleness and compassion, that's what's going to grow. What you feed grows, what you plant grows. And so it's the same thing in our spiritual lives. And we see that in David's life. As a result of David's sin, he suffered lifelong consequences in his own life, in his family, and in his kingdom. And so while we serve a God who is a forgiving God that restores things, there are still consequences. There are still consequences of sin for something like adultery or something like murder. I mean, those are big sins. Obviously there's consequences, but even in the small sin, there's consequences. There's consequences in our relationships. There's consequences even in our mental health or our emotional health. There's consequences in sometimes, you know, you could get fired from a job or a spouse would leave you or any of those kinds of things. There, even with adultery in a modern day context, if there are children involved, then that might mean uh, custody issues and mediation and, and therapy for the kids or whatever it is, there's consequences to our sin. It's not like, you know, once we have that forgiveness from God, that it's a, there's a magic button and it all is erased. Absolutely not. That person that David killed, that guy, he's still, he was still dead. And, and that is something that David had to deal with for the rest of his life. Now he might've had a restored relationship with God, but there's still this other side of the consequence of his sin. The second aspect is that these consequences that David experienced help us to understand that there should be this amount of holy fear that keeps us from turning away from God in the first place and recognizing that the mercy that we have from Jesus is already ours and and there's always a way out. David did not have to commit adultery. David did not have to commit murder. God always provides us a way out. Sometimes we we don't see the way out because we're not recognizing the way out. We want to fulfill our own selfish desires instead of saying, okay, God, I need you to provide a way out for me. And I will tell you, there was a time in my life where um, I had, for those of you that know uh, some of my background, I had been um, in an abusive relationship when I was really, really young, 19 years old. And I knew that the situation I was in was not good. But Christians don't get divorced. I mean, that was the mentality that I had been taught my whole life since I had gotten saved, that Christians don't get divorced. And so even though it was an abusive situation, I couldn't leave because Christians don't get divorced. And I remember just praying, Lord, I don't know how to get out of this mess. And there was a song, I don't even remember who it was by, but there was a verse in the song that went, Lord, please take from me my life when I don't have the strength to give it away to you. And I remember li- listening to that every night before bed and just, that was the prayer of my heart. Lord, I made a mess of things because here's the thing. I knew that that guy that I married was not a believer. He said he was a believer, but he was not a believer. He might have said it was, he was one of those ones that we t- like what we talked about yesterday, the actions and the words didn't match up, but you know, we want to do what we want to do. And so I had made a mess of my life and I, I knew that I couldn't get out of it on my own. And yet I could see God's hand on me through the situations and the circumstances. And there's been a lot that has happened in my life since then. Um, God has redeemed and restored areas of my life. And I'm, I'm remarried now to a, an amazing man of God, but there was a lot of consequence in the midst of that. There was a lot of heartache in the midst of that. There was a lot of brokenness in the midst of that. And yes, my relationship with God was restored, but there's still consequences to that. So it's not like when we go through something difficult, 
we come to God and then everything's better. That's not the human existence. But what I can recognize and what we see in David's life is that this place of holy fear, it it should be enough to keep us where we're supposed to be. I I have a drastically different relationship with God now than I did when I was a 19 year old kid. So, and because I know now what some of the consequences are of being disobedient to God's voice in my life, I live my life in a drastically different way. And I can guarantee you that David did not forget that lesson. That was a lifelong lesson that that he had. I can guarantee that he did not forget that. And then lastly, I want to talk about uh, verse 17. It says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. People make personal sacrifices, sometimes for good reasons and sometimes for bad reasons. So that's why God is not really impressed by what we can do for him. What God really cares about is for people to recognize their helplessness without him. And to surrender their situations to him. He's not going to turn away a broken and humble heart that is full of grief and regret over sin. And so when people put aside their selfishness and their pride and they cry out to God for forgiveness, they can be sure that God will accept them. And that's what we see in David. That's what I have experienced in my own life. We see that throughout the scriptures. We see it in Isaiah 57. We see it in Luke 18. We see it throughout the relationships that Jesus has with all the different women that we, we talked about that in the She Hears Bible study. That's the beauty of our relationship with God. So I'm going to go ahead and read Psalm 51 again with that insight. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God. I renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be a righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. God, we thank you that we can come to you in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of the mess of our lives. Lord, take from us our lives and we don't have the strength to give it away to you. We recognize that sometimes it's difficult to come to you in the midst of our mess, to even admit the mess that we've made of our lives. But Lord God, I pray that you would intervene on our behalf. I pray that you would help us to come to you in repentance and to not just confess this, this sin of our lives, but to ask you to create this clean heart within us, God, because more than anything, we long to be in your presence, to be in this right relationship with you. God, I thank you for the example of David and the way that he continued to turn to you, even when he had made a mess of his life. Lord, help us to do the same and Lord, help us to guard our hearts against even getting to that place in the first place. God, I thank you for the way that you pursue us and you love us and you forgive us in Jesus name. Amen. Hey guys, I want to tell you about a new resource that I just found that I'm really actually loving. It's called the Spiral Bible. And you guys know me, I'm all about resources to help you get in the Word because we know that the more that you are engaging with the Bible, the more that the Bible engages you. It's the primary way that God speaks to us. And so the Spiral Bible is essentially a Bible and a notebook all in one. It has 
pages that lay flat, just like a spiral binding notebook would do. And it's really the word of God for note takers. And so it's similar to some of the other resources we have, but it's much, much bigger. And also it is the first time I've found something like this in the King James version, which a lot of you have asked for. And so you can underline, write, highlight, doodle, draw, journal, all the things. And it helps you get more out of God's word and dig deeper into the scriptures. You can concentrate while you're reading and focus on what God's saying to you. And then also you can take notes to help organize your thoughts while you're reading. It I find that that really helps increase your memory retention and it helps your comprehension of scripture, which is the whole point. It's the reason why we do everything at She Hears and through the Hearing Jesus podcast. So if you would like a copy of one, uh, I will put a link in the show notes today. And then also I will put some uh, video and some photos of, of that on my Instagram if you want to see what it looks like. And I'll put a link there too if you want to check it out. They have all different covers, which I, you know, the cover, it's open. It's like a notebook and you're writing in it most of the time, but they have, of course they sent me a pink one. Um, I love it, but there's all different colors you can choose from. There's different versions you can choose from. You can do just like one book of the Bible. The one that I have is the entire new Testament, but I'll put it on my social media so you can see it. And again, I think it's a great resource, especially if you're somebody that has been looking for something like that in the King James version. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call in your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His. Hey there, it's Nicole Yunus, host of the How to Study the Bible podcast, where every single week we join together to encounter God through His Word. You can subscribe at lifeaudio.com.